example, but I'm hoping uh, to uh, break this down and hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll all know what uh, these hierarchical orthologous groups are and why we're so obsessed about them. Uh, so uh, this is, a, this is a, a session on function in general. Um, I mean, th there was no uh, session on evolution, so I think I guess the, the talk could fit in, in both places. It's quite clear uh, that uh, we, we've discussed this uh, already in a, in a few talks that sequences are very important uh, as a mean to uh, propagate function. And so more generally speaking, if we think of ortology, that's used useful in a, in a number of contexts. We've already talked about this uh, massive growth of uh, sequences, particularly non-modal organisms, and that is it uh, still in extreme contrast with the experimental annotations that are, that are concentrated in just a handful of modal organisms. And so obviously we need uh, sequence analysis for that. Uh, we need ortology also to uh, um, to resolve difficult phylogenies. There are still many parts of the trees of life that are contentious. Um, we also need to understand a bit better how uh, protein, and well, genes evolve, and uh, you know, we, we, we see now duplications uh, happening also even within species, and it's quite clear that this is a very important um, uh, phenomenon to understand evolution and adaptation. And maybe from a very pragmatic point of view, when we are, um, uh, I think many of us are used to be juggling between different modal organisms, and for a particular question, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, quite appropriate to find the best model for it. And so really underpinning all of these questions are the, 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 the point about finding the corresponding genes across different species. And so you may think, well, this must have been already solved a long time ago. Why, why are we still working on this? And actually, but the, the, the problem is, uh, is, uh, is still, uh, uh, you know, I think still really vexing. And so uh, to give an example, I go to this classic example of alcohol dehydrogenase, which you all know uh, is, a, is a, a large family that has expanded quite a bit, uh, particularly in the, pr the primates uh, that is used to uh, break down toxic uh, alcohol, and which is actually not only interesting because of our um, uh, frivolous lifestyle, but also uh, because it's been uh, associated with um, uh, diseases, you know, uh, that, that like Parkinson or schizophrenia and autism. And it seems to be uh, that this family uh, may have been associated with some sort of, uh, you know, the, the arise, uh, development of cognitive function uh, in primates. And so, you know, we need to understand it. And so if we start with the human uh, genome, we see there are three copies of ADH1, A, B, and C. And so now, because we want to get some information from other species, and all the species, we may go in the chimp. And there we see there's actually two genes there. And when we look at the ortholog, there we find an ortholog for ADH1A and one for ADH1B, but there's no ortholog for ADH1C. So what has happened here, maybe it was gained in the human or it was lost in the chimp. We may need to want to maybe go a bit further. Uh, in the baboon, there are four copies. And there, uh, things don't seem to be uh, you know, more simple, we find one copy for ADH1B, uh, but now there are three orthologs for ADH1A, and still no sign <laughs> of ADH1C. Uh, so we don't learn really much more from the olive baboon here about ADH1C. So let's go to the marmoset, and there we see actually there's orthologs all over, all over the place. And so at this point, I think most people just give up and say, okay, we are, we are, we are not going to look at this uh, fine grain ortology business. Uh, actually, what most people do at this point, and if you look at the literature, uh, comparative genomics uh, today still is mostly looking at one-to-one -one ortholog. So we're just now focusing on, you know, just a simple one-to-one -one relationship. So that makes this uh, relationship much more sparse. And so now we can have two groups, one cluster here of ADH1B, one cluster of ADH1A, uh, nothing for ADH1C. And, but notice how you know, really we've lost a lot of this information. And now the marmoset, for instance, is no longer useful to learn anything about this, this, uh, this family. So that's really too incomplete. And so the, the paradigm that we've been uh, trying to, to push in the, in the past few years is that of hierarchical orthologous groups. And so there's to try to capture the evolutionary relationship between the sequences in terms of key uh, ancestors. And so it works like this. So here are all our present day uh, sequences. And now we're going to try to relate, as I, as I mentioned, in terms of the ancestors. So if we go to the ancestral simian, for instance, we may, through sequence analysis, infer that there were three ancestral copies uh, and from, from which uh, the, the present day genes uh, have evolved. And um, so that defines three groups, right? And we can actually, once we've done this inference, we can go back to the leaves and then infer that yeah, there were some gains and some losses 
And so that way we've characterized these genes in terms of these ancestral simians. And now we can go a bit deeper in the past and think about the ancestral primates. And there we have uh, one group. Um, so all of these genes have descended from one ancestral gene. Um, and so there, at that level, we could put everything in one group. So in that way, we've kind of, you know, this is just a conceptual framework. We still do have to do the inference, but basically we manage to capture all of this relationship. And I think there are a few uh, interesting implication of that. I mean, the first thing is that from a functional point of view, uh, you know, if we want to understand the fine-grained differences between ADH1, A, B, and C, it's quite clear that we might learn from, un, uh, you know, other ancestral, uh, other simians about these differences, but like looking at the difference between the two marmoset copy there is not going to be very helpful. However, if you want to look at uh, some aspect that may be really, uh, uh, you know, kind of the common denominator, perhaps some aspect of, uh, of structure that might be considered across all of these, of these genes, then it's helpful to, to get these, uh, these uh, marmoset copies. And so you can see that from a functional point of view, you can uh, trade off between uh, integrating more data at the more coarse level or something that is more specific. Uh, also, the other thing is the geno genomes uh, nowadays uh, still are of uh, very poor quality. Uh, most of the genomes that are sequenced uh, are done in a, in a way that is actually arguably even getting worse at the moment. And so the terminal branch here may be very tricky, and if you are doing pairwise comparison, you may often you know, suffer from uh, missing data or redundant sequences. But if we have a framework like this, we can hope to maybe you know, uh, get better and better estimates about the ancestral uh, composition and therefore converge to something that, 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 that looks better as we add more data. So that this we've been uh, pushing for this, for this framework. Now this is in the context of the, the OMA database, perhaps some of you uh, might be familiar with it. We try to uh, relate uh, the, the, the these genes across uh, many species and so we start with um, about, uh, well we have about 2,000 genomes at the moment so that represents about 10 million uh, sequences and we start with a massive all against all comparisons, so that is uh, uh, taking a lot of time, it's about uh, 100 trillion alignments. I could talk for a long time about ways to optimize this, uh, but uh, we are just going to assume that this is could be solved, and then uh, from that we identify these pairwise orthologous relationships. So these were these connection that I showed in the previous uh, uh, slide. And then from this pairwise relationship, then we uh, are trying to build these hogs, so integrate across more than two species at a time. Uh, and so this is, um, so we've done in this work uh, some refinement both at, the, at, the, at that step uh, the, the where we identify, uh, where we get a better orthology graph and um, at the level of get hogs uh, to, to, to infer the, the hogs. So if we think about the hogs uh, as I defined them uh, before, uh, if we have a gene tree, maybe some of you, maybe perhaps the, the, the most uh, evolutionary minded of you may have noticed actually there is a direct connection with the, with the gene tree. If this is a gene tree, you know, where we look at um, uh, maybe here three uh, sequences in, in primates and two sequences in rodents, uh, then really, by definition, we can get the hierarchical orthologous groups. We could just go to the, for instance, the, at the primate level, there were three copies, so there should be three orthologous groups, and here they are. And then when we go to uh, the level of all the mammals, they should be two, there are two genes, so they should be uh, two groups and so these are all the genes that have descended, for instance, for this uh, B copy or A copy, and here they are. So from the gene tree, if we have a gene tree, we have done the, uh, the, 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 the reconciliation correctly, that's kind of a trivial problem. The, the trouble is that it's not that easy to get good gene trees and to uh, root them correctly and not have any mistakes because mistakes here will, will have a disastrous uh, impact on the, the hog inference. Uh, so we were trying to, th to think about ways to go from the pairwise orthology directly to the, to the hogs. And so we've, we've shown a few years ago that if you have a perfect input graph, uh, that actually the problem is quite easy. There's a bijection between uh, the connected components uh, for the, the subgraphs that are limited to the species in question uh, and, um, and the, 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 the hogs. So that's actually quite easy. The problem is, of course, we never have perfect input graph uh, in, in bioinformatics. And so just to, to drive home this, this, this problem, here's the NEDPH, NEDPH family. So in, in, uh, in, UK, in vertebrates, there are four copies, NOx one, uh, three, one, two, three, four. 
one and three, they have this structure and two and four slightly different partners here. Um, and of course, you know, they, they have slightly different functions. And so actually when you look, for instance, just at the, the disease associated with uh, these different NOx, I mean, uh, you get a little bit of everything. So you've got some, you know, for NOx1, colorectal cancer, inflammatory pain, he hearing loss, uh, NOx2, Alzheimer, uh, cardiac hypertrophy. I'm not gonna read all of these, but you can see, I think it seems to be associated with many di different diseases in a way that is somewhat specific. And so if we want to understand the molecular basis of these different uh, genes, if, uh, 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 subgroups, if we want to infer fine grain go uh, terms, then we need to be able to delineate these subfamilies. And so here's the, the ortology graph, and uh, it's quite fairly typical. So you see, we almost see our four connected components but there are some spurious edges and there are some missing edges. And so the missing edges, they're not too bad because these things tend to be uh, fairly uh, s strongly connected, but the spurious edges, they'll bring together paralogous families. To, uh, and so that's problematic. And so, you know, without going into detail, basically the, the idea we have is to try to decide whether, you know, the, the connectivity is sufficient uh, to keep things together or we want uh, to, uh, to, to cut. And traditionally, we've been working top down, so starting from the full graph and uh, cutting the, the, the problematic parts. And in this work, uh, we, we have a slight refinement of that idea. So really, the, the, the three key ideas here, and the details are in the paper. The first thing is uh, uh, in the input graph, we've, what we've noticed, actually there are many cases where after duplication, uh, there is uh, quite some asymmetry in the rate of evolution. So here we'd have like two copies, for instance, the primates. There's one copy that evolves relatively slowly and the other one evolves much more, uh, much more quickly. And so if you're naively looking at the ortholog just in a pairwise setting, you may, uh, you know, one may look like an ortholog and the other one rather like a paralog if you don't get the routing quite right. And so actually, uh, we, we've found many such cases and, actually, and, and quite often actually they don't, you don't get pretty much rewarded in benchmarks for getting also the other autologous copies because you know, they might have evolved functionally or you know, they might, in some cases, uh, they might, you might get pseudogenes. Uh, but in any case, we, we felt that we, we had to do a better job there and so we've, we've um, improved our ability to, to discover these pairs. Um, and another problem we've noticed now with poorly, poor, poor genome are uh, fragmentary sequences. And as a result, when you do pairwise comparison and you estimate distances, you may sometimes <coughs> do things on alignments that are not really consistent. So here's an example just with three sequ sequences where uh, basically the, the homology is inconsistent among the three alignments. So okay, you could solve that with multiple sequence alignments, but there are many uh, sets of, for instance, of quartets, if we do quartet analysis, and so that's not feasible. And so we uh, do some tests of additivity. And then finally, uh, this hog construction or that I alluded to, uh, instead of doing it top down, we now do it bottom up. It's actually much more natural to do it that way, and it's also much faster. And so in terms of benchmarking, so for that we used uh, the Quest for Ortholog's um, benchmark service, which is really uh, also a community effort to, uh, to try to uh, you know, agree on, on how to test ortology. He, th there we have the challenge sometimes of, of having, having to, to resolve questions that go back many millions of years uh, ago and for which we cannot really do like experimental tests. But nevertheless, this is for instance one of the tests, uh, species tree discordance test. And so um, OMA pairs uh, used to be, so this is typically, you know, uh, precision and recall type of uh, graph where you want to be in that corner. And so OMA pairs were fairly uh, specific, but uh, not uh, all that, um, all that uh, um, uh, sensitive. And then with, this is where you, so with the, the hierarchical orthologous groups. And so with the refinement I mentioned with bottom up, we got some improvement. And then looking at the, the inputs and doing this, uh, this refinement also on the one to many ortology and uh, the, the dealing better with fragments, we massively uh, increase the number of orthologous relations that uh, we can recover, particularly when we go a bit deeper in the tree of life at the level of uh, uh, vertebrates or actually deeper uh, towards, you know, all the, for instance, all of the animals or in plants. And in terms of speed, this bottom up has, uh, has been uh, tremendously beneficial. So this is just to, to give you a, a, an idea here. Uh, with, on, on, with thousand genomes, we could not really run our procedure on all the families. Some of the families, they are, they are graphs that contain hundreds of billions of, uh, of edges. Uh, but with the bottom up um, variants, basically this, this problem has been entirely solved and we can, we can once we have the orthology graph 
and for all of the hogs just on one computer in a, in a day. So this is all that is available. Uh, is also available as a starting material for uh, for gene function prediction. So we really welcome you to uh, uh, do uh, uh, you know perhaps consider using hogs as an input. Um, this is just an example on this ADH. One A a family here where we have the three copies and the human A, B, and C. And you know, but we, we connect all of life and so you could go back, you know, among mammals, chordates, and you could go and also even uh, uh, to, to the bacteria and you would see uh, these hogs inferred at all of these uh, uh, levels. You could run this on your own data with uh, OMA standalone. You can combine these also, the public data, export these from, uh, from, uh, from the OMA database and um, run it just just a missing computation uh, with OMA standalone on your private data. And then finally, a little plug. So Alex, uh, the PhD student uh, who's in the room, has a poster that will show you how you can use then these hogs specifically to do uh, Go annotations. And then I also another plug. We orga organize a uh, Go workshop at BC at the BC2 conference uh, next month in Basel. So if some of you uh, traveling to Europe and are staying a bit longer. Perhaps you can you can stay all the way to uh, BC2 or, or come back. Uh, and we are going to have, a, I think, a very nice day on um, on, on, on gene ontology uh, in general. W where are we now and what's next? And so that's also uh, a way to celebrate a, a book that we've edited on the on the topics. Uh, it's open access. So uh, if you're interested in uh, uh, in the topic, and I, you know. How how would you not uh, be, uh, you know, if you're in this session? I invite you to have a look and perhaps you'll find a, a chapter or two of interest. So thank you very much for your attention. Just want to finish with acknowledgement. So Clément Train is really the graduate student who, who's done most of the work there, and, and it's, a, it's a pity he cannot be here to present. Uh, Adrian, Natasha, and Gaston are the co-authors, and Alex is working also very closely on this, is here today and will have uh, the poster. Thank you very much for your attention. I have a very basic question. Did you, define, did you say how do you define orthologs if it is based on sequence identity, which is a threshold? Yes, so it's not, there's no threshold. So it is based on sequence, but basic, so, I mean, okay, this is a very general question, but basically when we are doing ortholog detection, what the, the property of the ortholog is they tend to be the closest pairs because they were the same gene all the way to the speciation event, whereas paralogs, they start diverging earlier. So basically, as a first uh, step, you're looking for the closest pairs. And, uh, and, and, and in some cases, if these are distantly uh, related organisms, the, the percentage identity may be quite low. And if it, they are very close, that may, that may be quite high. So that's a first approximation. Then there are some ways of dealing with uh, losses in one or the other species, or, or sometimes even like if you have differential gene losses, you could use a third species uh, that has retained, uh, say, both uh, uh, paralogous families uh, to, to, uh, to infer non-orthology. Uh, Benjamin? Yeah, I have a question about the blast all versus all because you mentioned uh, by experience that the step that is very hard as you say because it's an enormous amount of uh, computation it's very difficult even on very big clusters and you mentioned that there are tricks to go faster so I'm happy uh, if you can comment on that yeah okay so there I mean first of all there are some some tricks just simply in uh, in, in dealing faster with non-homologous sequences. So, so that you could do, for instance, by doing alignments, and if you see that even you know, with low precision, so you can do that in a highly parallel way, and if you see you're never going to reach a significant threshold, you can stop even before going to higher precision, which is more uh, time consuming. Um, there are some other ways, I mean, which, and so this is other type of thing that we and others are exploring, is to try to find some representative uh, sequences and then to do basically some sort of clustering around these in the in the sequence space. But I think the, a, a big challenge there is because of multi-domain proteins and uh, you know a lot of things sticking to, to to one another that you cannot really use the transitivity of homology uh, very easily because you will you will you will wind up with just one giant uh, uh, graph. So 
I think there's a lot of people interested still in trying to do better clustering, which would really make things uh, faster. But most of the interest is more at the, in, in, you know, in terms of very closely related sequences. And I think we need more work uh, in terms of uh, like the, the deeper homology where things get really messy. But, but that would also be key to speed things up. Um, and actually some people in the, in, in the community already is trying to do that, where they, they infer f first orthologous families <coughs> with a set of genomes, and then they just project the sequences uh, for a new organism onto these sets. Um, so I have a question. Um, regarding, uh, are you, uh, I must admit I did not read the paper, even though it's in my, because I sort of dissociated myself from the editorial process. Um, so uh, I will read it, but uh, are you using best reciprocal hit for orthologies or something more complex than that? Yeah, so okay. by and large is reciprocal uh, hit the, the, the first stage. So there are, okay. there are several refinements. One, one of the biggest problems of reciprocal best hit is that you will only get one ortholog. But as you can see, when you have a duplication, you can get more than one. So you need some ways of refining this. There are some ideas also about using evolutionary distances rather mm -hmm. than just scores because the scores are particularly problematic when you, are, uh, when you have fragmentary uh, sequences, as I've mentioned is often the case because if the sequence is only half the length, it will have half the score. And so that's, uh, that's quite, uh, could be really disruptive when you're uh, comparing the sequence. But, but the, the core idea is very close to uh, uh, reciprocal basic. And so that you will get to some some approximation of the ortology graph with that. And then you still have the problem of integrating these to more than two species at a time. Because in the microbiology world where I deal with, and I see that you do have bacteria in, in OMA, it's actually a pretty interesting question because we have these groups of genes that are retained together, orthologous blocks. So, uh, and we actually infer orthology from this contextual information and also use that sometimes for evolution. Um, my next question is really about bacteria. Did you use bacteria as only with whole genomes? Um, yes, you know. and, and in fact, so I think in bacteria there's a real missed opportunity at the moment. So a lot of people think this duplication and this whole business about building groups, that, that makes more sense for eukaryotes and in, in, in bacteria it's just presence and absence of homology. But actually when we look at, for instance, at that family alcohol dehydrogenase, we find in some bacteria that you, you have maybe 25 copies. And when we, you know about bacteria, I mean, they, it's usually not 25 copies doing the same thing, right? It will be fine-tuned for different process. And so I think there is uh, a lot of value now in, in going back, now that we have many genomes and we have uh, some methods to deal better with this, with this clustering, to go back and then see if we can find also paralogous families um, in, 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 in bacteria. And I suspect there are in many cases we'll find these. Okay. Is there a resource like this for RNA? Uh, I, not, not to my knowledge. I think a few people have done some forays into, uh, well, certainly findings at the, at the family level. I mean, sorry, you know, Alex is a, uh, has a RFAM and there, 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 there are different uh, resources that are trying to find families. But in terms of uh, pinpointing the duplication events and, uh, and losses, that's a bit less. But I have to say, for instance, non-coding RNA is evolving at a very different scale. Uh, and so usually even within mammals, y you have some trouble finding ortologous uh, 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 RNA sequences. So uh, may, you know, we're not there yet. Mathieu. Thanks, Christophe, for this talk. Um, I have a question. With this OX group, you want to identify gene, ortologous gene with same function. So uh, I, uh, sorry. <laughs> but uh, the point, do you define maximal evolutionary distance between gene in this host group to say, okay, they have the same function. So all I, I, I mean, it's a bit uh, ironic for this session, but I have not, I mean, I said nothing about function. Uh, in, in, and and it, th that doesn't, I mean, all the inference that we are doing is purely based on the evolutionary history of this gene. Now, the assumption is, of course, is that function evolves along these trees, along these hierarchies. And so by having this basic wiring based on the sequences, now we can, we can have a model. And so actually uh, Alex's work is based on this, but you know, a classical work like uh, th th that from uh, the Brenner group with Sifter is actually also trying to propagate function along uh, gene phylogeny. Here we use a slightly different and more, a slightly more abstract uh, uh, 
projection in these hogs, but it's ki kind of like this some similarities. And it would be really shocking if this was not providing some help then uh, to, to, to uh, improve function predictions, because quite clearly in many cases where you have these paralogous families that are retained, it's because there's been some changes uh, at one level or another. And just final comment, do you really think the quality of the genome are poor and poor? Yes, I think so, because m and most uh, genomes are just now one-off. People are using them uh, sequencing for a particular purpose. In fact, uh, I, I see now it's uh, sometimes the, the, the only data that get deposited are the, the raw reads, and so you don't even have the assembly and the annotation. So I think in that sense it's getting worse. I have a question about horizontal transfer. So do you deal with it, uh, how you identify it, or you just ignore this? That's a very good question. So at the moment, we, we don't identify it uh, uh, systematically in OMA. Uh, there are other people <coughs> who try to incorporate that in their ortology inference. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult problem to do it uh, in general. And uh, I in, some s in some ways, uh, horizontal gene transfer is not that disruptive when you are trying to build groups uh, because you may, you know, you. I mean, the, the, the groups, that, for instance, with this method, don't necessarily need to strictly follow the species tree. And so, if you have, you know, a, sequ you know, a pattern that really looks really atypical with a sequence that is, you know, uh, a, a gene that is usually bacterial that is among archaea, that, I that is going to be dealt okay. It's just you will have to use your own knowledge uh, to infer that that's probably due to a horizontal gene transfer. But this could be done as a second step. And once you've got your groups, uh, you, c you can try to infer the horizontal gene transfer. All right, thank you. Thank you very much.